I'm saying that. Alright, you feel like you're high. Alright? Just wanna sleep. Welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, which is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. You guys already know I've been rocking these helmets for years. Check them out at SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com where you can find out all the different options, visors, models, finishes. They got it all on their website. Check it out and get yourself a nice lid for this riding season. On today's episode, we have Sit Down Steve. You guys might remember if you've been following along the podcast for years, uh, the first time we really met was in this podcast room during the Fast Life Hood Ride 2 we did in 2020, I believe. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know if I was gonna like this guy. Where do we even begin? He's out there, right? But over the last couple of years, I've got to know him. We've actually driven across the state of Florida together. Uh, he's come to our camp out. He's done the down south camp out many times. And I've ran into him in Buffalo, New York. Like every time we get together, we have a good time. As I've gotten to know this guy over the years, I just, I'm in love with the fact that he just brings a lot of great energy to everything he does. And uh, he's a wild man. I'm not gonna take that away from him, but somehow he's won me over. On today's episode, we literally sat down the day after the Fast Life Camp Out 6, uh, did this podcast sober, and uh, I think we talked about a lot of cool stuff that I think you're gonna enjoy. Before you jump into this podcast, please check out our sponsors, Thunder Max USA, Arlen Ness Motorcycles, Lexan Moto, Lucky Dave's, Cowboy Harley Davidson, and of course, Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. There's offer codes down below to help save you money with all these brands and a lot of great people that I work with on a daily basis. I ride with their products, I work with them. These are also my friends. So check them out in the description. And yeah, let's get this episode with Sit Down Steve. So we're in it. This is, <laughs> I feel like I would, that guy's waiting for something. Like a, like a boom or a pop? No, just like, I don't know, maybe to get some energy. Dude, it's, it's post camp out, you know, we bear, our bodies hurt, our liver hurts, my butthole hurts too, straight up, like as much shitting as I've been doing yesterday, <laughs> I'm just saying, a lot has come out, nothing goes in. <laughs> that could be taken out of context really easily. Yeah, someone can clip that one and make another video out of it, but, well, thank you for coming, I didn't know you were, I made a point not to answer your phone calls for a couple of months. Yeah, um, notice that. I actually forgot straight up. That's my that's my excuse. I was literally in between uh, Wood Grain FXR's house and and Bruce's house on the way up there, and I was on the phone with Big Trouble talking about Daytona, and you called. And I said I'll call him back after I get off this phone call. Well, that phone call with Big Trouble was two and a half hours long. And then I forgot. And just f me. I don't, man, so I, don't I know. came to the camp out to confront you. <laughs> it's a fucking surprise i'm here <laughs> what made you what made you want to come back um because i had a blast the first one mm -hmm. i like to that was a good one flc4 yeah yeah it was a blast um and there's just a lot of good people there and they like to drink beer and talk shit and do burnouts and that's kind of my lifestyle so <laughs> uh unfortunately last year i was can can strength confined to florida i wasn't able to leave the state so yeah. i missed it so i did want to obviously we got to talk about that but there was this like thing that had been going on we had talked quite a bit about it especially at the the down south camp out two i think right when you went with me mm -hmm. so we were talking about how all the reels and and how you had this strategy for getting content and basically when you got pulled over you were in the mode of getting content for people yeah and how did that all play out how, how in did, Daytona. How did it start or how did it end? How did it start? I'm sorry. How did it start? Uh, we all were at this one shop doing burnouts, cooking, hanging out. People were selling T-shirts, just having a good time. And then we went on a street ride. Mm -hmm. And I was just on my Dyna filming with a gimbal and a Sony A7. And somebody did a wheelie. And we ended up going down Main Street. and someone, Or not Main Street, A1A. Somebody did a wheelie. There was like four bike cops there. One of the bike cops pulled out. That person jumped the median and went the other way. So the bike cop just stayed with the pack. And 
the whole pack stopped, except like, didn't stop. They just stopped at a red light. And we made it through the red light. So now there's just like six of us. Well, I'm on a Harley, one handed riding this thing with this big camera and gimbal set up. And um, I made a U turn, and the cop just seemed to be like coming for me. Like he just saw, like, oh, he's got a camera in his hand. I'm going to get him. Like, yeah. They just wanted to get somebody. And uh, I ended up trying to go on the sidewalk and drop my bike. I missed the entrance and I hit like the curb, fell over. Yeah, that's basically because you had this big gimbal in your hand. Yeah, so it was yeah. kind of hard to maneuver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> super hard to ride a bike you know, one handed, um, with a camera in your hand, you know, in traffic. Yeah. Where you can't you either breaking or clutching. You have to switch yeah. hands and all that shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I ended up dropping the bike and it wouldn't start. The cop came up, put a taser on me. This other guy got involved and, and literally I didn't even do anything wrong. I wasn't doing a wheelie. I wasn't doing a burnout. I did nothing, but I had the camera and so it had everybody's faces on there. So, you know, it's a good chance I could have got the guy that, first took off you know if they had the footage they would have got everybody you know wrote yeah. them tickets or found them later so i just got caught up in the moment some other guy got involved for some reason and was like trying to help out and like lifted my bike up and i got off my bike and then the cops started yelling at him i separated myself a little bit 150 people were on the other side of the road like yelling like come on you know ditch the bike half the cop come on let's go and so i kind of gave him a nod and i i don't know just adrenaline got me and i just ran across the street to, to get away and as I'm running across the street I get smoked by a car and I fly shit. up over the hood land in the median the car like blocks the cop to getting me I jump back up he's still running after me and I superman jump on the back of a bike and get away and um, where's the gimbal at <laughs> never dropped it <laughs> never dropped it. and all this is on video um, it's all on my Instagram hold the whole thing because I got the, the you know my footage everybody else's footage and then I have um the cop's body cam. Mm. And so uh, it's, a, it's a funny video. But anyway, so um, I ended up getting away, and then the, they tried to get me back in St. Louis like a week later. Yeah, so how did that work? Because I remember you made it back to St. Louis, and then just like, didn't somebody hit you up, like give you a phone call or something first? Or No, no, no. Just uh, just one day they're like kicking my door in, and I'm like, what? I'm like, I guess, that, I guess all that caught up to me. <laughs> and so I ran again. And um, I don't know if anybody's been in trouble before, but if you get arrested and you have a warrant somewhere and you're not in that city or whatever state, they extradite you. Well, I was in Missouri, and an extradition would have, they would have sat me in Missouri for like a month before Florida would have came and got me. And yeah. I'm like, no, this ain't happening. So I call Big Trouble. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn myself in. Call my cousin who's a cop. Say, hey, run my plates. Does anything come up? And he says, no. And he goes, but what, when I search your name, it comes up. I said, cool. So that means if I'm just driving, a cop's not going to scan my plate. Yeah. And it says, oh, this guy's got felony warrant. So I said, cool. So I drive to Florida, turn myself in, and um, got a lawyer. Thought I was going to be good to go. And the, I, the next morning I have court, and the judge is like, uh, yeah, we didn't deny your bond. And I'm like, excuse me? And turns out uh, he didn't even know anything about the case, and he's telling me how – a 5,000 pound missile going down the road is like extremely dangerous, but you can't argue. Yeah. So I just had to take it. And I'm like, I ran on foot. What do you mean a 5,000 pound missile? I wasn't in a car running from the cops. Like he thought I was doing this hundred mile an hour fleeing and eluding down a one a during yeah. Daytona bike week. This wasn't that. So I denied my bond, had to have the lawyer come in finally got out. And then the next hearing they go, um, all right, you're good. You can go. But, uh, you know, you go through the court process, but uh, you're not allowed to leave the state of Florida. I remember that. And yeah. I said, what? And so I had to give up. I had a girlfriend of four years. I had an inflatable bounce house business back home in St. Louis. I had two dogs. And I had to give everything up. Like, I never got to go home and see my girlfriend to, like, this day. Mm. Never made it back home. She ended up moving on, you know, after a year of me just not being able to come home. Uh, I had to sell my bounce house company and then eventually had to give up my dogs to another foster because I couldn't bring them to Florida. Yeah. And the person watching them was like, yo, I can't, I just can't do this anymore. Sorry. Mm. So life changed a lot. Do you feel like that year they were really trying to make an example out of stunt riders because of the year prior, there was so much, I mean, the year prior was the reels blow up with like mainly you and what you had going on. And then, you know, uh, you know, CJ and everybody else coming down and just killing it down there. It's hard to say. I don't know. Um, 
because we got away with a lot of stuff. Even that the year I got locked up, I mean, there was a lot going on. I think the biggest problem was, you know, I tell people that do stunts on motorcycles all the time. If you're doing a wheelie and you pass a cop, whatever. But don't see a cop and then decide to slow down in front of him and then do a wheelie. Mm. Like, you're just poking the bear. Yeah. So we got away with a lot of stuff. And our, our biggest problem was, why didn't we just stay, like, in the, you know, the hood ghetto part of the area, which is a lot in Daytona? Why did we go down A1A? I mean, yeah. that was just, like, basically poking the bear. You know what I'm saying? So <clears throat> I don't think it was more of they were out to get us. I think it was just... Like there's an area you could face. do it. Yeah. yeah, you know, and that's there's a the reason problem. why they call it a hood ride. <laughs> exactly, and um, so well, I wondered that because you would, you know, with you know these law enforcements are watching social media more, especially especially when people hashtag Daytona Bike Week 2020. Yeah, and they can just have somebody for the next three weeks just going down the line looking for everything that's going wrong or whatever. Super easy, and then easily trace where it was taking place, whatever. But you would think that like. Like, there's such a difference between this kind of newer, emerging generation of bikers. It's a lot more, like, led by, like, stunt riders and things like that and the old traditional Harley guys. And they don't mix no very well at all. And which I don't understand because what were they doing back in the day? Yeah. Doing drugs, doing burnouts, banging girls. You know what I'm saying? They were just partying. They were yeah. just partying. And we're doing the same thing. It's just... I mean, you know how it is, though. No matter what we do, it's like, whether it's a car scene, bike scene, whatever, it's kind of the older, you know, school generation that's, a, you know, maybe two two generations past or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're like, oh, well, we wouldn't do that. But then, you know, you kind of look back at the shit they used to do. Yeah, when they yeah. were 19, 20, 21, and it's like, oh, we are doing the same thing. Yeah, that's a good point. I always, I have thought about that before where you just kind of get, you have to be accepting of all the waves of people coming up because yes, you were like that at one point in time doing all this crazy shit. You know, I would say that now it's more in your face. Like they used to do that shit and you know, maybe a hundred people knew about it. It was at main street surges in 1974. Yeah. But now with the internet, it's like on, you know, it's just like when you did the burnout at, at down South too, it's like the comments as they drive those millions of views up, it's so like, divided like yeah. that shit's rad that's what motorcycling is about this guy needs to get shot in the head <laughs> right yeah and what's crazy is what were you telling me yesterday at what event the chopper guys are on the bars doing burnouts yeah oh uh uh mama tried and some of those same people that think that's cool were talking shit about this one yeah and i don't know if it's because i'm a newer school Rider, or because it's a hard, you know, because it's a, uh, it was a, it's like chopper. I don't even know what bike it was. I was so drunk, I don't even know what bike it was. I think it was a Dyna, honestly. Yeah. But you know, what I'm saying it was just like because it wasn't them, it was, I don't know, it was just literally the, the two of the exact same things burnouts in a bar. One was okay, one's not by yeah. the same view of people. You know, what I'm saying it's just, it was weird. It's weird. Yeah, it's like maybe, maybe the one where the chick was obviously pissed that it was taking place. Maybe people are trying to play the sympathy card for that that chick, but that bitch was a cunt. Well, all day, regardless, <laughs> regardless of her. Um, from my defense, I was blacked out, and I was looking forward most of the time. After I got it backed in, I never even knew the girl was there. I never even felt her tap my back. I was, I was just focused, and um, so I didn't even know that was going on. But um, I mean, I don't know if it makes it better, but whatever. But at the same time, you're right, man. Like, you go to places like Mama Tried. You got bars that are leaning into this this stuff because of – I mean, I mean, we, we we were talking about it last night. It becomes marketing, right? Mm -hmm. What What's a little burnout on this – it wasn't, like, marble floors or goddamn tile. Raw it concrete. was raw, polished concrete. Yes. Like, let that happen. Lean into it. You could have had 3 million-plus views about your bar – Instead, it's like you're mad because this is a family place. It's like, it's not a fucking family place. And when we got there, there was like three or four people in the place, and we brought, what, 60? At least. At and, least. And um, and like you like you just said, if if they would have embraced that and just said, hey, hey, you know, whatever, we would have been back there the next year. But where we go last year? Somewhere else because they made such a big fuss about it. And, yeah. you know, it is what it is. And I remember there was comments going on um, – one of the persons there were like, oh, he didn't even pay his bill. I messaged the the girl that was yelling at me. And I put a screenshot of my bank statement. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, really? I didn't pay. Here's my yeah. Here's my my tab. 
It says right here. They got mad because everybody's putting stickers everywhere, which I, I can understand that. I yeah. mean, the sticker thing does get out of hand. You know, sometimes it's like there's a place to put stickers. I think, like, putting them on signs like people do, that shit's all fun and games. And, you know, when people pass through, a little gas station slap every once in a while. But, yeah, when you're in a bar, like, putting them up high, and you know, I get that. All I saw was they were on the, my back. Yeah, they were all on your back. Yeah, you guys that had about thing. 60 stickers on my back. <laughs> but, yeah, I just wonder, man, because then, you know, like, what, earlier this year, or after Daytona, or no, when did when did CJ go to Mexico and get hemmed up? So that's a very funny story. So my situation happened, and, um, you know, then I ended up living in Florida. Things got great, got my bike out, um, got a bunch of exposure on social media. You know, things started working out for me. CJ joked with um, Carlos that owns Plex Audio. He's like, man, I need to go to jail for, you know, 30 days and come out, you know, smelling like roses and this and that. And then all of a sudden, CJ goes to jail in Tijuana, Mexico. <laughs> and <laughs> after he finally gets out, I was joking with him. I'm like, so did you just do this to, like, one-up me? Is that what it was? And it, was <laughs> it was hilarious. But, yeah, um, yeah he, his situation was wild. Yeah. They, didn't they plant a gun on him or something like yeah, that? Yeah, Absolutely. And they weren't even after him. They were after uh, Seabear oh. from the previous year. And they were trying to find him. And they just happened to be together. And, um, yeah, <laughs> CJ got hemmed up. <laughs> That's got to be sketchy as hell going down there. Yeah. Getting hemmed up in a Tijuana so, prison. So the problem in Tijuana is they don't feed you. Mm. So you, you have to have your people bring you food and water every day. Like, you don't get anything. Damn. Yeah. But luckily we were connected to enough people that – and they paid, which was even crazier. They were trying to get them out early, and they paid like thirty-five grand or something. And um, I said, "Sorry, this didn't work out." Blah blah blah. You know, he's going to be here for this much time now. And um, they actually gave him ten grand back, which is wild. You never think that in Mexico. But yeah, yeah. they we we tried to pay a bunch of money to get him out, and it just didn't work out. Damn. So how did it transpire with you? Whenever you ended up going back, you go to court. Uh, are you kind of like not in the know of what's going to really take place? Are you going to jail for a minute? Are you going to jail for, you know? I thought I was getting out of it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this is, I mean, I'm from St. Louis. So St. Louis, they would have thrown this out. It's not even a big deal. Um, and so I'm thinking I'm no jail time, nothing. I'm good. Like they're yeah. Pay a fine. I'm just going to roll, roll over. And then, uh, and I start talking to the lawyer. And they're like, yeah, this is, this is a problem. You know, they offered you like, two years in jail or something. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm like, I thought I was walking away. And it came down, came down. And, um, yeah, I had no clue what was going to happen to a certain point. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go home. Things going to be great. And then, no, no, you're still stuck here. Mm. And um, But it turned out good. Eventually, they, they offered me either 30 months probation um, or 45 days in jail with no probation. And I was Fuck like, yeah. yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Do the and 45 then, days all day long. And he goes, you can do what you want, but I'll recommend this. And he goes, let's go in there and ask for 30 days. And the least they can do is say no. So we did. And they said, um, yeah, 30 days. And we'll give you time served for the days you already spent in there. So I was, I went back. I thought I was going to spend 30 days in there. It was like 16. <laughs> I got like five days good time. The nine days I already served. And I mean, it was a, it was a, a win-win on that. Yeah. Yeah. It worked out great. Worked out great. And then I got to move to Florida. So what was the – why did you pick where you ended up staying in Florida? Just Did you have enough connections down there to help you kind of get on your feet? So luckily when um, – yeah, first off, Carlos from Plex Audio. So all this took place in, in uh, Daytona, right? Yeah. Okay. So right when that happened, um, Carlos from Plex Audio let me stay at his house. He moved his company there, and he just let me stay in his guest bedroom for like six months and just took care of me, which was huge. And um, without him, I wouldn't have been able to – I mean, it'd been a rough situation. So, luckily, Florida's so big, and there's so many different big towns. Um, for six months, I traveled twice around the lake. So, from Orlando, Daytona, Jacksonville, Panama City, Tampa, Fort Myers, Fort Lauderdale. I went to all these cities twice and mm. just, like, stayed for a few days, hung out with people that – you know, I either knew or mm -hmm. knew of or something. And um, Fort Lauderdale just seemed like the spot. Yeah. And they got a stunt scene down there too, right? Yeah. Is it more sport bikes and it's kind of evolving into the Harley thing? It's more sport bikes for sure. Um, there are some, there's definitely some Harley people there, but it's more sport bikes. 
Florida's always been big with the, you know, Sport stunt. Bikes. Yeah. And stunts, yeah. yeah. And they do what stunt wars used to be down there or something oh, back yeah. in the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems like a good spot. I mean, those that dude, Mitch, that you brought up, he, he had a good vibe. And I didn't know he was a dude that, like, went viral shortly before he came to um, down south. For wasn't it like he had a chick on the back and it she felt like they all went down or something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was um, standing burn ups, burnouts or something. Yeah, they're doing a burnout on this um, on this ride, and he just got a little too sideways and high sided, and he had this girl in the back, and they both went down, got all rashed up. It was pretty wild. Damn. Yeah, super wild. <laughs> That's the worst. I mean, if you go down, whatever. Me, I don't care. If I go down, I wreck my bike, I get hurt, no big deal. Mm-hmm. If I take somebody else out that's on the ride, and then it's like, damn, that sucks. That's like a really shitty situation. Mm-hmm. You got to pay for their stuff, and if if you do the right thing, but when you have a person on the back of the bike, and you wreck, that's just like, uh, just Tough. and it's, you know, what I'm saying it's a girl too, so everyone's talking shit. And oh, it's yeah, just yeah. a problem. Oh, it's man, almost it like you beat the girl or some shit. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that sucked for him, but um, I mean, he's good. She was a good sport about it. He was a good sport about it, mm-hmm. and. Um, it wasn't even his bike. So that was actually my old Dyna that I sold to a guy. And he was riding that bike. Did they impound your Dyna from? Daytona? Yeah. 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 Were you able to get it back? Yeah. Uh, three weeks later, they finally, re- after I turned myself in and got out, they finally did the release on it. And then it was like 900 bucks to get out of impound. That ain't bad. No, not at all. Shit, you like 50 a day or some stuff like that. I didn't think I was even going to see it again. Mm. Yeah. It's not bad then. So what do you think, uh, I mean, Harley, Harley, like the whole stunt culture in Harley, it's been going pretty strong for what mainstream now for what at least last five, six years, you would think maybe five, four. Yeah, four or five. Probably how do you five. think that's going to how do you think that's going to go? I mean, do you see it? Do you see a future with a lot of it in ways or how do you how do you see companies like reacting to a lot of it nowadays? You know, as far as like because you, you have the bell brawl, but now it's just the brawl, right? Like mm-hmm. there's no like bells not behind it is what they i think they still support it no no they're out okay um they had a new marketing person and they were just like yeah we're not doing this mm-hmm. so I mean, that's what it comes down to sometimes is you saw with bud light <laughs> you got a new marketing person that changed changed everything um yeah so, so you, you're some, at the mercy of of somebody that they just hired from some university that yeah. is gonna basically take what they learned on youtube <laughs> Yeah. And try to apply it to these scenes they have no idea what they're about. Yeah, so they didn't they didn't want to support it anymore and so it just had to fall mm-hmm. out and rebrand. Um I don't know, it's hard to say. Uh I definitely enjoy riding the Harleys mm-hmm. versus the sport bikes. Not that I don't I want another sport bike actually, but um I I enjoy the Harleys. I don't know, mm-hmm. it's fun. It's just a, it's a different vibe that I I don't know how to explain, but I don't know. I don't see it stopping. Yeah, yeah. I don't see it stopping either. I just wonder if there's like a, uh, like the incentive. Like, is there for, a, for companies or for us riders? For, for both. Like, well, I think I see the incentive for companies. You're getting it's average, it's it's exposure, right? It's to mm-hmm. whatever. But incentive for the riders. I mean, you know, a, I, half the stunt riders I talk to, like they uh, they're doing it just because they want to stunt, which is you know, it's the punk rock thing to do, right? But at the same time, you know, that can only take place so long before those tires add up, those wrecked bikes and parts add up, and, you know, or have forbid you have a fucking spill and you actually break something, and then that affects your actual job. Like, so, like, it's almost like you need some kind of something to chase in order so that it it breeds the competition to get better. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. It's definitely with Harleys. They're so expensive. That's, yeah. the, you know, not everybody can do it. And um, that's one thing I hate to see right now is because, you know, I saw it in sport bikes so much. You'd have guys having just dogged out bikes. Yeah. And now when people got to Harleys, most people had decent ones. And then now I'm starting to see people that are just like throwing crap together to stunt. I'm just like, that's the whole reason I like the bikes is because when I saw East Coast in and, um, their bikes look dope. Yeah. And then you get another guy. Yeah, he's doing the wheelies. But if the bike doesn't look good, it's like, for me, it's losing the whole point of being mm-hmm. on the Harley. Yeah. I like it when the bike looks good. I like that style of bike. And we can do some of the same things, you know, on the bike. But when you have a purpose-built stunt bike that's a Harley, 
and it doesn't, you know what I'm saying? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Like, if you take... Like, for us, if you put lower handlebars on it mm -hmm. with, you know, say, a total of, like, a six-inch rise, that would be ten times easier to ride and do wheelies on it than having an eight-inch riser and a, you know, a mid-bend bar. Yeah. Like, it, it... But it doesn't look good, in my opinion. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that that defeats the whole purpose for me. Yeah, there's got um, It's style, too. I mean, it's what skateboarding was, right? Yeah. Like, and a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, you're on a Harley now. You can only do four tricks. And I'm like, okay, well, I like those four tricks. And it's on a bike that looks good. And I can just go out there and ride it, you know, yeah. and not have my back hurt. And I got music. <laughs> and I can put a chick on the back or whatever. But the sport bikes, they never wanted anybody on my bike. Had no music. You know, you're kind of bent over. It's just different. And then the cops look at you way worse on a sport bike doing a wheel. Oh, yeah, they're almost looking for it, right? Yeah. That's what I love about – I was just staying at the camp out when we came back and all those state troopers were there or whatever. Yeah. And I'm on my fat bob. I'm like, yeah, I was just the one out there doing the burnouts. But when I come back, I can just be like, hey, man, I don't I don't know who was doing that. Like, this is a nice bike. This is – you know what I'm saying? I don't know who these guys are out there ripping things up. And I wouldn't do that never on my bike. And they, you know, they completely dismiss me because I have this bike that looks yeah. clean and it's not purpose-built for that. Well, you you know, on the internet, you'd always see people that they would kind of argue the whole unknown versus East Coasting, and obviously East Coasting is way more technical riders. You know yeah. what I'm saying? But there's something about when that unknown video drops every year, whenever they do it, everybody watches it because it they look those bikes are sick as hell. Yeah, they look good. There's like and the production value. The production value is good. So there's a there's a wow factor to the East Coast and stuff, right? And the bikes do look good, but those unknown bikes are on a whole other level of looking good. So yeah, there's, and they used to say that about skateboarding when I was when I was growing up. In that, it was like, you, everybody can do a kickflip, but some for some reason that guy when he does a kickflip, it looks badass. Style, style, man. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps that's that's everything. You oh, yeah. know, yeah, absolutely. And I don't even know. It's, the East Coast guys are definitely technical. They got yeah. so much skill and just hang it wide open. Um, and then the unknown guys, I mean, they've just been doing it forever. I mean, they, yeah, well, they started it. Isn't all the East Coast and stuff kind of from that whole, like, dirt bike kind of culture? Like, Yeah, those guys all rode dirt bikes. But, I mean, so do those guys. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, Southern California. But they were more freestyle riding. motocross and then dirt bikes out here, weren't they? On the East Coast were more, like, Racing. what they do in, like, Baltimore and stuff like that. Oh, no, no. Those guys grew up, I think, riding dirt oh, bikes. Oh, they did? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Because it has that similar style, though. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I don't know much about stunt scene. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm probably <laughs> surface level stunt guy. Oh, you can do stunts? No. Oh, I thought that's what you're saying. I used to be able to power wheelie. Yeah. <laughs> do a mean fucking first gear run out. Your bike will do it da, now. Da, 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 da. Your bike will do it now, no problem. Yeah, I'm oh, like sure a power will. wheelie. On the sport bike back in the day. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying the Harley though. I've done a, I haven't popped a wheelie on this one. Bruce's old, Bruce's bike. I did a couple on that one that I, Managed Shit. to save. <laughs> you think you're flipping, but you're only like. <laughs> Someone told we were in Virginia Beach. I think uh, somebody. I think Cody was telling you about that. Big old Cody. Mm -hmm. We left the bar in Virginia Beach, and we were all fucked up, and we were like a mile and a half from the house. And yeah, I just let one go. And at the time, I had you know I talked to Zach, you know, lot lizard a lot, and he would yeah. tell me like, "Oh, look for this." And so I, I don't know if I was so drunk, I was able to hyper focus on a feeling. <laughs> I definitely didn't get it to balance point. No. Uh, but you're probably three inches off the ground, but it feels like you're flipping when you're just. I was high enough where I could see the like the horizon of the road through the lower, lower part of the fairing. So I don't know where that is in reality uh, as a sit down. Maybe like halfway. Okay. But that's still that's a good fair. feeling. Yeah. That's a good feeling. That's a good look. Definitely came down hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I like it. I mean, it's. Even if I'm not doing all the technical tricks like on the um, the sport bikes, the Harley just is a different vibe. It, it gets attention, man. Like the the, the motors are deeper. They're, it's like it's a rumble. It, it just when I'm doing a, a little burnout and I drop the clutch, do a little burnout, and then I click second, and the second gear rips through the whole gear, and it's just like wide, loud. That's that's like all right, that's cool. Camp out, fucking four in the morning. Those burnouts, it's like as, as annoying as they can be, depending on what level of sleep you might be trying to achieve. It's it's a pleasant sound. It's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny because, you know, some people are like, they want to yell at somebody, but they know they can't say nothing. 
Yeah, we're gonna do walk out and say, shut the fuck up. And then yeah. there's like four hundred people over there yeah. just sitting there cheering it on. It's like, come on, dude. You're, you're I, what is it about a burnout that gets people just going? I don't know. Like it's, this year. It what was it, Saturday? Yeah, on Saturday, the stage. about four or five o'clock. You're like, Steve, liven up. Like, come on, do something. Let's get this let's get this party started. And I start looking around, said something about the stage, and then I think maybe it was Justin. My machinist, I think he was like, oh, there's a ramp on the back. Somebody said there's a ramp on the back. And I kind of look, and I'm like, hmm. I get up, just casually walk to the back, and I saw him. I'm like, oh, there is a ramp. I walk over between Big Trouble and Simpsons <clears throat> stand, and I move something out of the way, the strap holding the tents down, go over there, get my bike, warm it up a little bit, come back, and boom, let's get it started. Yeah, he had a hard time hooking that front tire up. but It was not. Yeah, it was so much dirt up there. It just wanted to. Yeah, there was beans all over it the night before. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of puke, a lot of puke. puke. But it got it, it got it it got some some blood flowing oh, yeah, in my dude, body. It, it, it definitely. It, you're you're right, man. A, a good burnout will will like get the adrenaline going in some people. You know what I'm saying? That they're, they're there to witness it, and you know everybody pulls their phone out immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, which is a, it's a weird. I'm I'm guilty of it too, but it's it's like a weird phenomenon that's kind of like happening anytime something like that starts to take place, the first thing is, what the fuck's my phone? Oh, yeah. You know, and then it's just... But just think when you have a crowd of people standing on both sides of a street or whatever and, and bikes are about to leave or come in or something, mm -hmm. everyone goes, do a burnout, do a burnout. You try to get someone to do it. And yeah, then the do one person really. does it, and then it's like the next person, and it just gets people excited. Well, like, you know, we did that little short ride, and, and uh, you and I, f I forget the other guy's name He's on, that, that was doing the burnouts with mm -hmm. us and stuff, or with you guys. It looks badass, man. Like... Just a video, watching it, you know, being able to, like, basically roll and burn out, drift a little bit. Like, it's, it's fucking good. It looks cool as shit, especially in camera. You know, so I can't wait to drop those videos whenever they end up coming out. But Yeah, it almost you know. didn't happen. Why not? Because the cops were bad. Oh, yeah. So what happened with the cops was um, Sketchy Glide hosted a ride out Friday morning, I believe. I think it was. And it was like all the fast guys, like Steve Chamberlain, all those guys. They were going to go hit Talamina. And we've always said, like, when people leave the campground, everybody hauls ass to that first town. That's Remember, you went on that, that time oh, and yeah. uh, barely made it? <laughs> uh, I beat you on the way back. You did not fucking beat me, dude. Calm I pulled down. into the campground first on the way back. He's like the guy that like, says, hey, let's race after he's already got a head start on it or some shit. And then I pass him, and then I, he didn't. Races over, and then he sizes the race again and passes me again. That's what happened, but uh, absolutely not what happened. I totally one thousand percent. Okay, and that clapped out fucking white bagger you got. <laughs> they had pee all over it from the night before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I won. I did pull in the campground first, whether you knew we were racing or not. <laughs> I did make it back. So. Uh, so basically everybody hauls ass to that first gas station and it's 30 miles and almost never any cops. And so what happens is, and I, and I always tell people this, when you're in small towns, never pass on the shoulder because that freaks people out when you got, if you got nine bikes, six bikes passing you on one side, it's, it's an, it's all, it's enough for them to like, Oh shit, what the fuck, you know? But then when you get another bike going on the other side as well, that's when they're like, this is bullshit and they're calling the cops. So they had 15 or 20 phone calls to the cops at that one time. And because it's such a big county, there's no no city police there. Mm -hmm. It's all state troopers and sheriffs, basically. The sheriff's department's cool. Like, they were like, hey, if you guys want to do stunts out front, let us know. And we'll kind of, like, regulate the traffic a little bit for you guys. Right? Yep. State troopers like, fuck that. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, their rules are different. And so, basically. Yeah, um, little boys. After they left, this the state trooper came to the, came to the campground. They called me up there. I went and talked to him, and he was chill. He was cool as hell. He's like, man, we appreciate you guys coming and doing this event every year. You bring a lot of money into this part of the Oklahoma. But because there was 20 phone calls, I have to come address this. It's part of my job. I'm like, all good, dude. Yeah. And uh, we just talked for a minute, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's – it just you know it is it's hard you know what am yeah, I supposed doing? to do? And I I offered him a beer. It's <laughs> like you want a beer, dude? Want a roadie? And uh, he was chill. But then like from then on, it just like there was cops everywhere. Yeah. And so they came back in hard. Yeah. And and they they pulled a couple people over in there, 
but they were given they were just giving people warnings and then i think one or two people might end up getting a ticket but they were just trying to make their their presence felt yeah um i don't know and they started hiding in the bushes everywhere and shit and it's like they really wanted to bust us. They just came to the camera and saw the drugs. So sketchy, so, so sketchy, sketchy guy is the one that uh, ruined that for us. Yeah, it was all on him. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. Yeah, but yeah, so that sucked. But luckily, you know, Adam's gonna build that. I hope he does. He had talked about doing building a big concrete uh, flat area to Asphalt. do stunts. Asphalt. Asphalt. I even told him. It needs to be asphalt. He's like, oh, even better. That's cheaper. Yeah. But yes, for stunts, asphalt. Mm. Make it asphalt. It's consistent. Is it sticker? No, it's consistent. So concrete has your grippiness based on how the person finishes it. Mm -hmm. So those little nipples when they brush it, they're the lines in it. You know, that's what creates the stickiness. Well, depending on you could brush it one spot, not the other the same, and it's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So you think you have so much traction, then all of a sudden you have no traction, just like because it, it'd be like a polished concrete floor, where it's just slick as can be. Or like you go to like um, an industrial place and you have a bunch of semis like making U-turns, and mm -hmm. those tires will literally break down that concrete, so then it's like slick in a certain spot. Mm -hmm. Well, asphalt's just the same consistency. Just because of the rocks and the it, uh, It's just the same. Tar. There's no, yeah, there's no finish. There's no... But what about like, you know, it's harder to get a, a, a foundation in asphalt. And if you get too much sun, it starts to warp it some. If you have the right base, it's fine. Yeah. And th that, that campground's pretty shaded. So I feel like he could put it somewhere where it's not going to be like literally in the sun the whole time. I mean, it probably will, but it'll be fine. <laughs> but Well, you can't have trees in the middle of a parking lot. So, yeah. Well, you can have it around it. Not going to be enough. But anyway, no, asphalt. <laughs> but once, well, hopefully he does that because, you know, I'll come out there and rip. Yeah, he was wanting to get Tony to like host, like come out and do the busted knuckle stunt tour there yeah. a couple times a year, and that would kind of uh that would kind of like offset the cost, offset the cost basically because it'll bring more people out to the mm -hmm. campground. But I think they're just they're they're kind of trying to figure out what all that place can be and make it as modular as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, the Cave River. It's like there are people that want to do like wedding events there, but then there's like a lot of different. Motorcycle organizations host things there, small Do little they? rallies and stuff, um, like veteran veteran owned bike clubs, and there's all kinds of different stuff that comes through there. Sometimes it's just a little weekend camp out. Sometimes it's like a poker run thing, but I mean, it could be all those things. To be honest with you, he has enough space and yeah, whatnot. And it's the only thing I really, the, I would probably ask for this more than the concrete is like a really dope really professional pavilion shower shitter. Oh yeah. Con like instead of a trailer, like when you go to Sturgis, like yeah, I know those campgrounds have like legit like showers. shower shitters setups. Yeah. And it's like, it's nice, super nice. And I even told like yellow rose Canyon where they do born free Texas. Like, dude, if you just did that, you just host a rally and be like, this is the, we need better shitters event. Really just better shitters. I'm yeah. cool with the shower. I'll take, it's like water bottles and put it yeah. on my body. I don't care. It's the shitting. That's the problem. <laughs> and when you're drinking that much. Yeah. And you're eating the food truck food. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It starts to flowing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have actually spent more money on food knowing that I don't have to shit here. Mm. Or you could shit there. I could. Sh yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, I like a good shit, but I mean, you know, put me in a, the right situation. I went and shit in Craig's trailer. Uh, poor, <laughs> poor Craig. He got it real hard this weekend. Yeah, because he... Um, <laughs> I was drunk, dude. That's should take the mic away from me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anybody realized you were drunk, though. I don't think I'm going to yeah, get back on stage again. Did you <laughs> do you remember when you when you bent down and talked to me and I gave you a little nudge back and you fell completely on your back on the stage? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't remember a lot of shit from that night. Mm-hmm. I remember walking over to you while you were doing the burnout, and then that was like, oh, that was it for me. I was done after that. I went straight to the tent. Well, I think you also had a a few moments of black black and not blacked outness before that when you were on stage. Oh, and I then after did. that, you sobered up a little bit, and then you came over and did the burnout with me, but you just came out of nowhere. That was really surprising. I thought you were sleeping way well, before then. I had to come over there and you know help your influence out. Yeah. Well, I mean, you put me on the map, so. For sure, dude. You know how hard it's been? Just, you know, constantly trying to You probably get a lot of you. flack. Like, hey, why do you why do you mess with that guy? Like, 
you're the only stunt rider I know on your level that that uh, for lack of a better term, goes both ways. <laughs> <laughs> like you can go out and stunt and do that but then you can come and like literally be the the life of a party at, at a place that's not necessarily i wouldn't call it your people but like it's not necessarily a bunch of stunt community no no i exactly know, you know? What you're talking about. like you know daytona i'm surrounded by 60 100 of the same people that do the same shit i do mm-hmm. and here obviously i'm the only you know basically yeah. the only one out of you know i guess there's a few yeah but it's not that, you know, it's a different, it's a different crowd. So I get exactly what you're saying, but I do that cause I like it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And, um, I think it's also good because I want people to understand that I'm not full of myself. Does yeah. That make a sense. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Some people might not go out there and they're like, Oh, are we getting paid? Well, I don't, you know, I'm doing it there for the love. Cause I actually enjoy hanging around with you guys and yeah. just the environment and being around people that are like minded about, motorcycles and drinking and talking shit i mean do does the stunt like when you're in a big stunt thing do they get as hyped up about the things that are taking place like as like these you know like how it was at the bar and day and at down south versus you know all the stuff that takes place at the campground and shit um i actually don't think so because we're more numb to it because we see it all the time Mm -hmm. we're you know we're in it you know versus some of those people at the campground I mean, that might be the first time they've seen somebody get on stage and do go through yeah. all six gears on a blow a brand new tire off on a wood <laughs> stage, you know. I mean, right by a river, that's just they, you know, so it's they just get a little more excited, yeah. Where for my guys, yeah, they would have recorded it, but it wouldn't have been the yeah, the hype wouldn't have been there as no. much as kind of like you said, if it was it. my guys, we probably would have had 10 bikes up there <laughs> and we would have, I was that really would have lasted like an hour. We probably went to f- through the floor. I wasn't even drunk and I was like really wanting you to try to ride off the stage. And I literally had no concern for your safety on that one. Yeah, that bike would have, <laughs> the frame would have broke. You think? We could do a little blip it right off and that way you can land even. A blip it. It's not it's is not a dirt bike do? where the front tire is gonna come up and so you kinda land with the back tire and then the front tire comes down. No. I would have You gotta pop a wheelie right at the end, dude. Even if I would have hit it hard, it probably would have came down and the neck the, the front end would have just broke for it. <laughs> not to got, mention my wrist probably would have broke. But you got crash bars though. <laughs> That's when it goes on the side, not like jumping down <laughs> no, I'm just trying. five feet. I really thought you don't were, think don't think I didn't think about it. Yeah, did you? But get I was like, away. it's a little bit taller than I thought it was. Well, it's here's the difference. Like I try to tell some people there, um, the bagger, you know, to O2 bagger, it's got a bunch of money into it, but I only spent six grand on it. Most of the parts are sponsored, so you know, it's not, yeah. not as big of a deal. The Fat Bob, I mean, I bought it. I mean, for like twenty grand, like mm-hmm. nineteen something. So. It's a lot different to throw away 20 grand versus six grand. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's, I'm a little more cautious and, uh, when I'm on the fat bob, I don't want to completely destroy it. Mm. So what's going to happen with, uh, with your event? Uh, that's, that's retired. It's done. It's over. You don't ever want to do it again? Mm-mm. It's two out of hand. Mm. I mean, two out of hand. The last time it was, the last time I saw it happen, it was like they were shooting or some shit. What was going on with that? Man. Um, Jeez. No one's going to understand this because they probably have no clue what the event is or they never saw the videos. But um, it's this motorcycle event called Ride of the Century. It's going on for 19 years, and it's basically a big stunt ride on the streets. Well, for so many years, we held it, and everything was fine. But when we, like, the ride was done or starting, we were, like, doing stunts on this off-the-beaten-path road. Mm -hmm. So it's fine. There's no traffic. Do what you want. Well, that place closed down or we couldn't do it there anymore or whatever the case was. Went to another place. Well, now we're on a public, kind of like a main road. Mm-hmm. And um, not a main road, but a main road. And um, people are still doing burnouts because it's just, you know. What happens at a stunt mm-hmm. road? Well, there's normal traffic in the city that just comes through there. Buses, everything. Well, there were so many people in the road. And, you know, they would every car that came through, like, had to slow down at, like, five miles an hour to get through. And people were doing burnouts in front of them, so the traffic had to stop. And mm-hmm. everyone's like, oh, do a burnout to every car and this and that. Well, then some guy's doing a burnout. And there was this old guy leaving a bar down the street who's been there. Apparently, we found out afterwards all day drinking, wasted out of his mind. 
Well, someone's doing a burnout in front of him. They have him stopped, waiting for that to stop. Well, some people jumped in the back of his truck. Well, he freaked out and floored it, and then he ran over this dude. And um, so then the whole crowd, like, lynches the truck and, like, slashed the tires, kicked the windows in. And someone said that somebody opened the door and started punching this guy in the face. So then we're like, okay, well, then who was it? Well, then they thought it was this one guy. So they start going after him. So now a whole mob's trying to lynch this one guy for punching an old guy in the face, which apparently didn't even happen. And um, so he pulls a gun out. Well, then they go around the corner, and the guy drops the gun. Some other guy goes to pick it up, and he accidentally shoots himself in the leg. <laughs> cheddar bobbed it? <laughs> yeah, he cheddar bobbed it. And, uh, yeah, it was just out of hand. And so it's just – it was too, it's too much liability, and the vent's too big, mm. and – you said you started getting like five, six, seven thousand people. What was it? It was like four thousand or so okay. at like the peak. But then it, it was too much of a problem because when you have four thousand bikes going down the highway, and they're all doing stunts, so they're not even doing the speed limit. They're doing like forty-five, fifty. So you're back in traffic up. Mm-hmm. And now you know for you to get on an on ramp, you might have to wait ten minutes to get on. So it's just creating hec- hectic all over. And you're seeing all these people do wheelies and burnouts and stuff on the road. So people are calling in like crazy. And so it just got us too much attention. So then we quit promoting it and got it back down to around a thousand or so. And, uh, but now it's still too hectic and it's just not worth the liability because all we need is, you know, say it's 11 o'clock at night people are still out there doing burnouts and some cars flying down the road and can't see and they smoke them and hit them. And it's just, it's just a bad deal. So it's not worth the risk in my opinion for us to host the event because if we don't host the event, we can avoid a potential tragedy. You ever think about, like, maybe... And plus, it's illegal. See, your event's <laughs> legal. You're at a campground. Yeah. You know, that's the one thing I, me and my um, old business partner always said, you know, we wish we would have put 20 years into something legal. You know, mm-hmm. playing hockey or volleyball or, you know, whatever. Put 20 years into something that was legal <laughs> instead of doing it into something that was illegal. You know, and you can only go so far with something that's illegal. Eventually... You know, you can't get corporate sponsors and this and that. And so we wasted a lot of time and energy. That's why you see a lot of the other, like the Rob One Wills and those guys are all on off. Yeah. Based on courses, doing their stunts and their, their productions and stuff like that. And you see a lot of those guys. So you look at the top guys in the Harley stunts, you know, um, Seabear, Reckless 203. Um, they have these huge followings and they're not, and they have them because even it's the same burnout. It's a different environment every time. Rob, one wheel is super talented, but it's the same drag strip or same hilly roads with no traffic that he's doing it on. Even mm-hmm. though they're great, nice, super brand new bikes and all this. Look at the following. Look at the views. Look at There's the that element of what if when you look at like Sea Bear and Reckless, right? What if, you know. Yeah. They're going through L.A. traffic, you know, swinging outs. on this bagger just on the rev limiter. Rotors are glowing just in and out of traffic and they're just like holy crap rob could do the same burnout but there's no traffic and there's no element of what if yeah. so it's just not as entertaining and that's what makes we had the choice and we could have went the other path yeah let's and, say and could you have not have found a like venue like a drag strip you could have rented out or it's not that it's just you know you could have went the 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 path like jason Britton, mm. but you know or another guy aaron colton but in their contracts you know, from Red Bull, it says you're not allowed to do, operate this motorcycle illegally on the roads or we'll, your contract's done. So you can't go and do stunts on the road. The only time he did do stunts on the road was like Chicago, where Red Bull paid to have the city shut down these mm. so many blocks, just like the Ken Block videos. Yeah, yeah. And it it just didn't seem as entertaining to us to, you know, go that route. I mean, we were called the Street Fighters for a reason. <laughs> um, and so we just chose to keep doing that. Yeah, I was wondering, because if, like, say you did take Ride of the Century and you did, like, try to take, you know, assume that three to 4,000 people were going to show up and you were going to, like, do a big drag strip kind of all-inclusive thing. I mean, first off, the drag strip's going to want all this liability insurance or, you know, whatnot. Then if you do rent it out, and let's just say they want twenty grand for the weekend, that means that every head's got to pay, you know, 50 bucks or so to get in. And then, then when you add money to things, then people don't really show up to it as much as when it's free. You and know what I mean? Anybody can go sit there on the bleachers and watch a wheelie go down the drag strip. Yeah. 
it's a little different when you're riding next to somebody that you follow on social media and you get to do a wheelie with that guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Even if you're not that talented, but if you could just ride a balance point wheelie, you're, you know, you're riding with your idol basically. I would, I would say that it's so a much more, it's so much more crazy to be riding next to somebody while they're doing a wheelie mm-hmm. on a Harley or anything. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. way more, it's, it's just yeah. a different perspective. Exactly. Right? You know, like I, I've got plenty of footage of you from the, the year previous, you know, when we went out and did a little rip where I beat you on the, on the bike and <laughs> you're in the Crocs just fucking, you know what I mean? That yeah. shit is even for me who seems Willie for 20 plus years now. It's like, that's still cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. You know, you should see the people that when they're just like, um, I'm down in Fort Lauderdale on my fat Bob with, you know, sorry, not having a helmet, but no helmet on just wearing a backwards hat in flip flops and shorts and a t-shirt right there on the beach. And I'm doing a burnout going down the road. They're just like, <laughs> what? You know, the, the comments on people on the, on social media about my, me wearing flip flops is just. Yeah. They, a lot of people on yeah, That's just, that's all. That's the only two cents they own. But if you're you there know? next to me and you're like, Oh my God, you're not going to be dude, like this dude's doing it in flip flops. This is wild. This is nuts. It's just a different vibe. It's a different yeah. feeling when you're right there and you're yeah. next to them doing it versus they're on a controlled environment on a drag strip and you're in the bleachers and they're going by you. It's just see, not that's, as cool. That's the genius in it though. Right. Because I mean, you've been stunt riding for over twenty years, yeah. right? I'm not saying that you never have hiccups. I mean, shit happens, but shit for happens. the most part, I would say on the higher percentage side, you can do these tricks mm-hmm. and walk away unscathed. Obviously, because you know how the bike needs to feel and, and work as well. So, by doing it in those Crocs or in flip flops or in what some people would say, oh, that's just insane. All that does is create more engagement. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, it's and great. Yeah. It's like, oh, this talk all the shit you want, buddy. Let's just Thank keep you. it coming. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Send it to your buddy and talk shit. Tag him in it. So he comes <laughs> and talks shit too. All those little buttons you press on Instagram just makes this thing go further and further. That's so perfect. If you hate this, you don't want it to happen. Yeah. <laughs> they don't understand that. Yeah. And uh, I love it. Yeah, it works out great. <laughs> but I, yeah, like you said, I take calculated risks. You yeah. know, I'm not going to be on the highway in fourth gear trying to do a burnout. With no helmet on and flip flops, like mm-hmm. it's just not, you know. But if I'm in first gear, you know, yeah. going 15 miles an hour, like it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, it's always a. It's, I mean, like I said, you got to find ways to stand out amongst other people, and and I'm not like I said, but many times, I'm not the best stunt rider. I never have been, never will be, and I'm basically semi retired when it comes to doing all that, and I just do kind of things that make me happy. Yeah. But I try to do things that do make me stand out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, because I'm not trying to be the best. I'm not, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. But I mean the lifespan, what is the lifespan of a, of a stunt rider? You know what I mean? I would say probably, man, three to five years. Really? That's short. Oh yeah. Cause you do it. And once you find out the balance point, you, then you get to a certain point and then you realize that it's not easy to do it full time. Mm. And then you realize that just because you're doing great wheelies doesn't mean that you're going to blow up on social media because you got to do the unique things that are going to get the views. And then you either pick a job or a girl or have a kid. And then that's the end of writing. Yeah. It happens really quick. The amount of people I've seen come and go, you know, it's it's yeah crazy that's motorcycles in general man you know yeah so that's the difference and that's another reason why you know i'm at this event is because i do it for the love of motorcycles not to come out there and be like sit down steve like oh i need to be you know the show of the party or this or that i do it because i just love it Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and my lifespan still riding bikes doesn't prove that I do this for the Fun. love of yeah. motorcycles and not the notoriety. Like, I mean, I don't know what else does. I mean, I've given up so many girlfriends, jobs, money, had nothing multiple times to do whatever it took to Going still to ride because I just wanted to ride. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So many people would have gave up so many times and yeah. I just do it because it, it's what I enjoy. Yeah. And like I said, the one thing I wanted to do was come to this camp out this year. I was like, I missed it last year. I'm so pissed. And, um, 
if I was going to do anything, it was I'm making this one happen. And well, I appreciate that. If I got to do anything else, then cool. If I didn't, well, I was going to make this one. Do you think you're going to do anything else this year? Yeah. Yeah. Um, leaving here and going to Panama City for Thunder Beach Bike Week. Leaving there and going to Myrtle Beach Bike Week. And then um, maybe Ohio, Sandusky Bike Week. And mm-hmm. then going to Laconia. Oh, shit. That'd be nice. So those are like the... Have you been to Laconia yet? Yeah. Yeah, I had a blast. It is. I just couldn't go last year. Dude, I want to go. I rode through there a week before Laconia once. The yeah, one I nice. went and saw you that time mm-hmm. in Buffalo. But, yeah, I want to do it one year. Probably next year will be the one. Born Free is yeah. always, like, right there. You're missing this year because it's 100. 100th. Uh, probably yeah. it's the one to miss if you're being real. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be wild. Yeah, prices are crazy expensive. Yeah. But it's going to be a good one. And what I liked about that event, in which it might not be the same this year, who knows. But you go to Daytona, and there's, like, it's fun to blast, but there's like, you know, it's frowned upon to do burnouts. Now that's not frowned upon to do burnouts there, but you go from like the high octane, high octane bar mm-hmm. and drive the mile and a half to like Weir's beach. There's not a patch of the road that doesn't have a burnout mark. <laughs> Even if they're only 20 feet, there's a 20 foot one. There's a 10 foot one. There's a 50 foot one after that. And there are like 50 of them all next to each other. Yeah. Literally the whole place, the whole path of like where the traffic flows, there's a burnout going both ways over the whole place. I mean, it's just everyone <laughs> does burnouts everywhere the whole time. Like it's, it's insane. Nice. And that's what I like. Cause it's kind of like, you you get wild. Have you ever, what, what is the one in Texas? We used to have Rot Rally. No, we Galveston. Still, oh, uh, they, or Lone Star Rally. I heard that one gets like a bunch of burnouts and gets kind of wild towards the end of the night or something. So they had this little downtown area called um, fucking, goddamn, I forget the name of it. Uh, shit, it's on the tip of my tongue. Well, there's this downtown area, and it's one of those deals where they, they try to like get you to pay $10 to come down the road and park in there. Mm-hmm. I think you still do, but. It's like wall to wall bikes. Mm-hmm. It's like Main Street in Daytona, but a lot deeper, like okay. off the, uh, you know, like you can yeah. put bikes. And then there's two way traffic. And people come in there and they rev their motors mainly. Mm-hmm. It would be almost impossible if you'd be able to do a burnout and actually roll through it. Okay. You know what I mean? I don't know how, I haven't been in a couple of years because it's always the same time as down south camp out. Um, but the seawalls, I mean, it's a, it's not, I would put that up there with a Daytona bike rally, right? But there's a lot you more. Don't care. I don't. Yeah, there's a lot more club involvement down there. Mm. There's a lot more like macho bikerism going on. Yeah. You know what I mean? To where it's like I don't know if really stunt bike world would. You'd be very outnumbered in that that scene. Yeah, that makes sense. But that might always be a good thing too. Maybe because I might be the only one doing the burnout down there. And then that's fun. You just never know what, what crowd you have, man. Like, you never know if this crowd is the ones that love burnouts and love wild shit or if they're the ones that, like, think that you just fucking touched their child or some shit. You right? know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like the burnout in the bar. <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I think I think that everybody should always – should. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to this. I think that everybody should maybe do – Every event twice. Yeah. At least twice to give it like a, a chance, a 50-50 chance yeah. of fitting within the world that you want to be in. I, I, I like doing things twice just to – you just never know. First one could have yeah. been a bad deal and then – all right. I would say because my first time ever going to Born Free, I wasn't as – I didn't have as much fun. But then I realized it's because I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. And then the next time I came, I knew people, and I felt like the whole time it was just – Oh, fuck, you know, just talking, and, and then you actually get to meet more people because when you're talking to that one guy, you know he has a homie or something or he's with this brand or whatever. Daytona I've only been once, and I just had a bad experience, and unfortunately I haven't been able to go back. How long ago was that? 18. Okay. So it was kind of the beginning of, like, a lot of the performance push mm-hmm. coming into things, and it was one of those Daytonas that was pretty much, like, 50 degrees okay, and then, yeah. like, 30 at night, and yeah. it was just – and we camped, and it was a fucking horrible experience. Um, and I felt like I, you know, I wanted to go drink and I just felt like no, everywhere I went, like I was scared to drink and leave. So, so I, yeah, so I totally disagree with the whole drinking right in there. Cause True. I think, um, I've actually never known one person to get a DWI, um, at Daytona. I don't think I've known a person to get a DWI at any bike event, to be honest with you. 
You ever hear that that clause they have in Sturgis where you can, uh, if you get a DWI there, you can like pay some, like right on the spot, thousand dollars. Not on the spot in the street, but at the at the the jail thing, it's like a thousand dollars, and then you are banned from Sturgis for like what is it, three hundred and forty something days? No, <laughs> till way. right when you can come back no again, way. and it doesn't go on your record or something. So I, there's. There's a clause in there somewhere, but there's something like that where you can get something. Like, there is that. Interesting. But, no, it makes sense because what is what does everybody do that rides a motorcycle? They yeah. go, a Harley. They have all these Harley events. They, they drink. all drink. Yeah. And I don't care if you're the the owner of one of these big companies. You're on your bike, and you're going to a place, getting some food, talking to people, having a beer. I yeah. mean, everyone, everyone does it. And so if you start giving out DWIs left and right, it's going to get around and people are going to stop drinking. And if people stop drinking, that stops the revenue coming in. And then, yeah, bam, and you know, all these, event. all these places like they, they, they're like mafia stuff. They do all this extra taxation on all the, uh, the places that sell alcohol. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. It's just like the deep element area. Like rent down there is like 20 grand. If you're a bar. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're just selling t-shirts or trinkets, then you're four grand. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they make more money from the tax on the alcohol than they would from the DWIs. Exactly. So it it doesn't make sense. So me personally, I've rode, I've always ride the the bars every night in Daytona and ride back um, almost every night and never had never had an issue. <laughs> I'm not saying I should, but I mean I do. Yeah, it's one of those things. I mean I, I think that but people... I always get a hotel right there. Okay, yeah. I would say that like it's definitely. You shouldn't go out and get just straight blacked out drunk and just go right around. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, no, I get it. But like I said, I, I always try to get a, a a place within like a half mile of like Main Street just so mm-hmm. that I know I don't have far to go. Yeah, yeah. That's and that's right. more of not necessarily being concerned with the DWI, but more concerned with my safety mm-hmm. of not, you know what I'm saying, just not getting <laughs> hurt or killed. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, man. You just have to come back to Daytona and I, I think with me for. Sure. I can't. Hang if you can my make, wife will not let me hang out with you in Daytona. It's not the first time I've heard that. Because <laughs> I'll be getting in trouble out of proxy, dude, just because I'm in the fucking environment. Yeah. <laughs> it's like to have a good time. That, that's good. I mean, I, I love that about you. You know, which is crazy is um, this is the first time I've never seen. Uh, a center piece with beer in it. Well, first time we've podcasts. done a podcast where we're not drinking. That's what I'm saying. Is this is this is awkward to me. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, interesting. Have you ever done it without drinking? <laughs> I don't do a lot of them without drinking. You not this what? early in the morning. Uh, oh, I have. I, there's pl- there's times where I go on trips and I'll do three or four podcasts in a day, and. Um, yeah, you know, we might have a beer or two here and there, but I don't know. So man. you're drinking, but not not on everyone. You know, I've done plenty of them when it's not. But usually, it's like say it's like a new brand. Mm-hmm. There's certain ones that you just have to drink on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or have a beer at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's certain ones that you go sit down and this brand's telling their origin story, or this person is telling their origin story. There's so much context that that person is getting out that it's easier to. You know, I don't need, I don't need alcohol to listen to someone's story and they might not need it. They might need a drink to get to loosen up, but you know, yeah, I don't know. Some of them you do, some of you don't, but dude, I'm, I really want to just chill and drink it for like a month. I'd really like to do that. We said that. And what did we do last night? We had a, we had a drink or two. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It happens quick. Uh, well it happens, you know? Yeah. I don't know. So what's your plans this year? Dude, I got a lot of shit. I got, uh, I got, I was just complaining about the two bikes I got to get painted in literally not enough time for Texas Hills. And then we have a hard push for date for, uh, born free. I got to get the lowrider ST painted and built. Then I come back from that. And then I have 11 days before when I get home from that. And then I go back on the road with me and the homies trip, but we cut our trip in half this year. So it's like two 10 day trips instead of one two week or 20 day trip. You know oh, what I'm really? saying? And so this year we'll, we'll, we will have completed all 48 States riding yep. together as yep. a group. That's super cool. And then 
So this the first trip in July is going to be up like straight north Oklahoma, Iowa, you know, Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, kind of around the Great Lakes and then back through Missouri mm-hmm. home. And that's going to uh knock off all the Midwest for us except for we have West Virginia, South Carolina and Florida. We've we've all been to Florida on our Just bikes. Never together. Not together though. So we're going to do like a loop in September. Florida, South Carolina, roll the the eastern uh, Smoky Mountains up to um, Jacksonville. No, like up to uh, Boone, North Carolina, and then over into West Virginia. And then, then I'm going to split off there and go to New York for Indian Larry Block Party. Mm-hmm. And the other guys are going to hit home. After what, we hit West Virginia, then it's all 48. What's the date for Indian Larry? I think it's like the 24th or 23rd or right around there in September. 10. Okay. Why do you got like a Daytona coming up after that or something? Man, I got a wedding. My cousin's wedding. Man, that sucks. <laughs> How close of a cousin? Close. Close. <laughs> <laughs> right. Man, that sucks. I wanted to go to Indian Larry. Yeah, I think this is, I could be wrong, uh, but I think this is the last year they're doing it at that location. Oh, really? So I thought it was going to be the last year it's going to exist. And that still could be on the table, but. That location in Brooklyn, I think, is just getting so gentrified that it's yeah. like uh, making it hard for them to st- keep that spot open. So I don't know. Did you see last year when they <sighs> I'm the fucking when they did the burnout on the container <laughs> and launched it on accident? Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. That was wild. Wow. That's the stunt guys, man. We just we just turn it up just a little little more. How do you get them? Like everybody hold the bike on a wall and then do a burnout on the wall. <laughs> right. At least you got off the bike. Dude, it landed on some chick or some shit. Or no, some chick fell off of it and like busted her ass open or something like that. Two kids died. <laughs> I don't know. I'm joking. <laughs> no, that was that was pretty wild. Um But I'm excited to uh I'm excited for the QS trip. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to that too. What do you, th- you think they're gonna do uh um the reckless guys up there? Are they gonna do their stuff anymore? No. What all happened with that? Do you know? Um, I think he was on the hook for like a hundred grand, eighty grand or something, with the government or with the the government the fines. Yeah, the government. Um, yeah, they said that basically all the they wanted him to pay all the overtime for all the cops that had to come to his event that they told him not to have. Damn. And they said they, if they do it again, then it's a problem, like a big problem. So they're not supposed to do it this year. <laughs> Did they gonna do it? They were wanting to do it with me. They wanted to do a Rise of Century East Coast and party in St. Louis because they still want to have a party. Mm-hmm. And St. Louis is kind of like a free for all. Y'all don't have the y'all have the no chase policy, right? Yeah, but that don't. So all that means is don't turn your lights on and say you're in pursuit. Mm. That's all that is. They're still chasing you, and they want you to wreck. And then they're gonna be like, "Oh, pulled up on this motorcycle that was doing a hundred and." Yeah. yeah, that's all that is. Okay, you'll see the cops doing eighty miles an hour down side streets, just they don't have lights on. The we biggest problem is if they wreck, then they're that's a problem. Y'all could do it here. I, I'm done. I'm I'm good. I'm good. I just want to come to your guys' events and not have to, <laughs> not have to sell t-shirts, not have to wake up. You know, if I go out till five in the morning the night before, mm-hmm. and I don't make it somewhere, then I'm not in trouble. Yeah, I guess if they did put like a pad out there, it would just. At the campground to give a, you can easily just have that shit happen in there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It needs to be big enough. I hate going like like when we were at Bell Brawl with you at, mm-hmm. at uh Sturgis. And Sturgis and not big enough. It's just not big enough, man. Like there's not like you can get a wheelie up, but as soon as you get it to like any kind of balance point, it's like it's time to put it down. Yeah. You know what I mean? It definitely needs to be long enough. Yeah, big enough. Um, and it'd be cool if it was like you had a square spot mm-hmm. that was big. And then you had like maybe like a, a one or two lane road that, you know, say the square spot was 100 feet wide mm-hmm. and two or 300 feet long. But then you had like a, a 15 foot wide road that, you know, was another, That'd be cool three, another 300 feet. Yeah, because then you could kind of almost line you some know, people you, up kind of there. Yeah, because then you could like start the wheelie and then, you know, get bounced, slow down, you know, get where you're at, get in your groove before mm-hmm. you have to slam it down. Yeah. And then if you want to do a bunch of burnouts that are real wide and, you know, get a little more nuts in the the big square area then you're good i think it's it, y'all should probably like whether it's you and tony or somebody should probably get with adam and see where he was wanting to put this at 
Yeah, hundred try to like get him to make it correctly because I like I that road idea. Idea. I dope. would, you know, basically if he was said, "Hey, I'm willing to spend this much. You get this much square footage for that. Design it however it's going to make sense to put on the biggest show." You know, with that. Mm-hmm. So instead of saying have a four hundred by four hundred square, we say have a two hundred by two hundred, yeah, and then a long road, and you're still spending the exact same money. You're just fifteen foot wide. It. That's enough space you can kind of rip it and you know turn around if you had to come back down and stuff. Most yeah. most traffic lanes are like eleven feet wide. Okay, yeah. So fifteen's plenty. Mm-hmm. So it's like a lane and a half. Yeah, that'd be, dude. I think that would like literally be a game changer for for a lot of things up there if they pulled that off. Because then you can, like, pair it up. You know what I mean? You could have, like, the Bust and Knuckle Stunt Tour there. And then you could have, like, kind of like an open mic night almost a little bit with some of the other guys that want to get out there and try some shit. I think it would be a fucking a really good opportunity. Yeah. So, I don't know. It would be dope. I Like I was telling you the other day, man, there's, like, other events I want to, like, try to build. Yeah. Do you ever get to that way, like, where you, you kind of, like, you had success with ROC. Do you get in this mindset of, like, I like the idea of creating stuff to give people fun? Yeah. Hundred percent. You know. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, it's it's just money. Yeah, I would love to build a big facility for stunts, events, road course, I like like to, all kinds of things. I like to find people that I feel like w- the crowd that I can bring can offset the need to pay them for this. Mm-hmm. Like say, say if you find like a a nice place that has a restaurant, bar, something going on, but they have the space where we can actually host a show. I'd rather be like, look. I know I can put 500 to 1,500 people in your parking lot or in this venue. Mm-hmm. And I know that you're going to sell this stuff because, I, you know, you get the other thing. Say, if I'm going to give you 10 grand for this weekend for this spot and then you get to sell your own beer and not give me that, like, how am I supposed to make money back? Mm-hmm. You know, and you just play these games. I'd rather be like, hey, look, how about you just waive that fee. You sell as much shit as you like and let us sell some vendor spots or something for ourselves or something like that to make our own money. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've always wanted to have my own bar. Yeah. And then, you know, since it's instead of like you having a bar and trying to pay me to come out, if I had my own bar, I could be like, hey, we'll do bike night and I'll put on a stunt show every Tuesday for my own bike night because it's bringing more people to entertainment yeah. and they're staying there longer, spending more money on alcohol and food. Yeah. And so it just makes sense. Yeah, and 100%. I wish I could, you know, wish that would work. When I went and did that Iowa trip earlier this year, I went to a couple, you know, there's a lot more when you get up in that Midwest area. There's just so much more. I don't even know what kind of bars you'd call them, but it's it's just comfortable. It's a night. It's like you don't feel like you're in a seedy place. You feel like you're in a community environment. And uh, I just the whole time I was like, man, I want one of these. Yeah. You know what I mean? It'd be so cool to have a spot. Like, so Jeff Wright from this guy, Church of Choppers, I don't know if you ever heard of him. Mm-mm. He's out of Des Moines, I think. And so he has this place called Tacos and Taps, Taco Tap House or something like that. Basically, they sell basic-ass ground beef tacos with shredded cheese, lettuce, all that stuff, just as basic as it gets. And they're like three bucks, and they're fucking delicious. That's it. That's the only food he sells. And then the rest is a bar, pool table. It's all biker stuff everywhere. And then he has a shop down the street where he builds and does all this stuff at. I'm just like, that's the coolest shit in the world. Absolutely. Have a place that you can create community. And it's like, I think about all the bike nights that we host and all the shit that we do. And I'm like, man, all like this, we're giving them all this extra money, right? Yeah. Wish it was just an art. We just need an investor. <laughs> that's all we need. We need someone with a bunch of money saying, Bars hey, are fucking hard to open, man. They, they are hard to open. If you're just Joe Blow saying, I want to open a bar because I was a bar back or a bartender for 15 years. It's less hard to own and make successful when you already have a following, uh, a bike night, a stunt well, agree, show. But it, it makes it easier. And, and the biggest thing, because I, I literally wanted to have uh, a whole like facility where I wanted to do you never been to, stunts. Have you ever been? You've been to Stroker's? Yeah, it's great. It's perfect. So that kind of vibe, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I want, but I wanted to create a, like a, um, basically like the pad that we want to do at Adam's place. I wanted to have a drift pad and a motorcycle stunt pad, and then I wanted to involve that to like, um, an eighth mile drag strip, and then I wanted to have a road course where you could drift cars on the road course, and then I wanted to have a stage for like music stuff, and then I wanted to have like, uh, three hundred thirty foot like sand drags for. 
um, dude. for like side by sides. <laughs> but what I wanted to do was start basically you start with the one thing, and when that works, you have a you have a, a architect come out or was a planner, mm -hmm. and you say this is my end goal. And we want to do it in five different stages when it makes sense. Yeah. And so yeah. you just you just have the room to keep expanding to doing what you want. So it's all laid out perfectly. Does that make sense? It does. But I, if I was going to play devil devil's advocate, I would say that that like say ha, being able to have a concrete pad is the most valuable thing because you can do everything on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, if you have a place you can store some kind of movable stage, you know, bam, there you go. You got your stage. You need the space. Put it back up. But like certain certain like trends, I don't know that I would build a spot for that because that shit could like die out in five years or ten years or whatever, yeah. you know. But but what I was saying was I want to have a place for everything. So if you yeah. if you got a little bar, and you just had a bar and some a pool table and this and a little pad to do a bike show, just make sure you have enough room to expand, expand. it to gr keep growing into the bigger thing. And so yeah. you say it's hard to open the bar, but open a small bar just for your bike nights. And yeah. then if it's working, it's paying for itself. Well then pave a bigger area and say, now we're going to do this big show there three times a year mm -hmm. or twice a year. Then you have the room to grow into it. So that can make more sense. I, I you get what I'm saying? I'm on board with that. Yeah. There's two just things. Don't, just don't bottleneck yourself yeah. to, to finally open a bar up in a great spot. And you have a little parking lot. You can do a bike night, but then you can only hold 400 people. Yeah, make it to a spot to where you can slowly keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So just because you only built the small building on this, you almost got to find like an industrial area. It's kind of because that, that's all I was going to bring up is that like usually bars, you know, when you go up in the like, you know, around the Great Lakes, those kind of bars are more community based. Like they're on the corner of a in a neighborhood, right? Yeah, I think they're like that in St. Louis in some aspects yeah. too. But if you, if you're gonna do anything motorcycle related, you got to be away from housing. You got away from housing, but you need to be close enough for people that can go and um, fly in if they need to. Um, and they need to be. Well, I mean, like, you know, you just add so much more to well, no, buy a major airport, preferably you, yeah, international. You, you need to be like, you know, 30 to 50 miles away from a city. So the people, if they want to get a hotel or this or that, that don't want to. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be close enough to where you have normal stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Branson, Missouri. Yeah. Right out there by Dollywood. Yeah. Branson. Branson? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I know Branson. We used to go there as a kid every year. <laughs> we man, I, I do like the idea of it. I think it'd be a cool place to have something of that kind of nature. Um I don't know. I feel like I don't know. I like that idea. I, I think that like as a stunt rider, you know, we were kind of alluding to this earlier, but like you gotta get this exposure. Right. And then you have to find a way to turn it into something else. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. And that's kind of how I feel about social media in general. It's like, what good is it to have X amount of followers if all you're doing is trying to gain more followers? Yeah. How do you transfer whatever this is into some useful, you know, thing that can that can matter? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So maybe it is a bar. Maybe it is hosting events. That's what we're going to do. You're going to find the investor. You're going to start a bar down here. In Texas somewhere, and you're going to create it. And when it works, we're going to do the second one down in Florida that I'll operate and take care of and run that one. Oh, that'll, be the, that'll, so be the gonna that'll be the second. I'm so going to trust you, dude. Well, that'll be mine. You know what I'm saying? That'll be number two. And then you'll get another one out west, you know, Arizona or something, yeah. California. And then you do that. And you just, you, I'm, you know, works. I will say that as, much, as many different things as I thought about doing investment-wise once I get to that level, mm -hmm. I Bar is kind of the only thing that makes sense. It goes with this world that it we live in. It goes with the world we live in. And like we said earlier, everybody that rides a motorcycle and comes to these events, they all drink. So if I had a bar that I could put a studio in for the podcast, how sick that'd be? How I'm drunk we'd be? I'm telling you, <laughs> you got the bar, you got the podcast, you got a little garage, you got the parking lot to do the show. You got a covered mm -hmm. pavilion parking lot to do, you know, just like at the hardcore show in yeah, Daytona. Yeah, yeah. You got a huge pavilion. So weather's not going to screw you up and you have that. And then, you know, you got a little area for some, some stunts and stuff like that and plenty of parking and everyone's good. You need to find what state has the least amount of taxing on the alcohol. Hmm. And you'll you ever think about this. Let me ask you this. Talk to me. All right. Let me paint this picture for you. <laughs> <laughs> so Ooh. if you look at, 
if you look at like this day and age of social media, right, this mm-hmm. is going to be along those lines. And you look at all these towns, these small towns that are kind of deteriorating in some parts of the country, like maybe, you know, it's between yes. when you have a following and you, you know what I mean? Like you're not relying on the natural resources around it to gain money. Does it not make sense maybe to go somewhere like Tucumcari, New Mexico? That's kind of like a falling apart. Is that a real place or did you make that? No, it is. Okay. Tucumcari. Yeah. It's just an odd name. Well, it's like part of Route 66. There's a lot of cool little okay. things on it. You go there, you build something, and then use social media to bring people to it in some form or fashion. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. And kind of build up the entire economy because – that road, that town's becoming forgotten because Interstate 40 took them off Route 66, right? Mm-hmm. And so now there has there's a reason people want to go to that place. It's the same thing. Like Dallas has always had a bike scene, but now we're kind of also known as having a performance bike scene, one of the biggest in the country, you know. And it's like, well, that happened because of social media, and then more people flocking to it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. Or you look at like uh, there's I don't know who they are, but I we live so close to Waco that. There's some like couple that pretty much owns HGTV now because they just went into Waco and started doing all this fucking HGTV stuff and is now fucking I don't know who they are but they're kind of famous <laughs> I guess. Was that guy say say hey who are you to Justin? <laughs> yeah, that was the funniest thing ever. Hey, let me know I get you some parts because who are you again? <laughs> so no, yeah. So I want to tell the story because it's the funniest thing ever. So the guy that blew his motor up on the road glide, the white road glide, and got uh, his bike towed. And he was in the underneath the pavilion changing his motor the whole time. Well, Justin, my machinist, walks over to him and says, uh, man, this is awesome. Like, blah, blah, blah. He's like, hey, let me know your address. And, you know, I'll send you some parts. And the guy who looks at him is like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Justin had a my machinist hurt shirt on. Yeah, and something. Hat, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just like, you know. <laughs> so did 20 other people there. That was the funniest thing in the world. Oh, man. That yeah, humbled him a little bit. <laughs> he needed it. Yeah. <laughs> no. He needs it. Yeah, for sure. I found out this weekend he's more cockier than you. Yeah, he is. I might step my game up. Yeah, a little bit. Um, what do you think about that, though, man? Like, what do you think, like, I mean, if you're a motorcycle, like, you find some small town that's kind of in that same concept, but there is gyms of riding close by that may be overlooked. So the only thing I would say about that is if you're going to create an, uh, something like, well, I guess, I mean, you're doing it. I've always wanted to be close living to where I would create something because I don't want to have to drive two hours to go meet with people and look at the yeah, this yeah. setup and this and that. So I want to live, you know, basically pretty close to whatever I'm doing. Um, I mean, obviously, this ain't going to happen in a place like Miami or L.A. and shit like that. No, no. Know? But I'm just saying, like, you know, if you're taking these one this one little city, you know, Think if you did an event five times a year at Oklahoma at the campground. I mean, it's going to eventually get hard because you're not there. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And if you're the one owning it and running it, you know, you kind of need to be there. I would would move to a place like that because it'd be cheap. I mean, think about it. Like, all everything property-wise is going to be cheap in a place like that. Yeah. So it ain't going to be shit to live there. And if you're making all your content, I don't necessarily have to stay there. I can go travel and do certain things. But you get a thing running, I mean – I don't know. Like, of course, <laughs> those towns are riddled with meth, so it's going to be hard to find people to work that it doesn't end up mething up the bar, you know? Well, you always have meth and need to run it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, that's <laughs> straight lace all your life, and, you, you know, you go to you this one bring, town. You just bring your crew in, and, you know, they run the gas station. They run the the subway you own. They run the <laughs> the whole I town's like yours. Yeah, dude. Fucking like it. Yeah. Be like, fine, you don't want to eat here? Go down there and eat. And then they're like, fuck that. I'm it's not going to be down there, too. They yeah. follow them over there and open the door. So what yeah. you want? <laughs> yeah, you come out of the back. What do you want on your foot long sub, sub sandwich? No, I just think about that. I, I think about other ways that, that, to transfer this world into it. And I think in our motorcycle industry, especially the Harley and customizing, we always look at our, like, the I guess, the forefathers of custom motorcycling, like your Arlen Nesses and – you know, Dave Perowitz, all these people that kind of helped build the custom motorcycle industry over the last 50 years. But I don't know that the way they did it is the way that our, our generation needs to do it. I feel like there's that's kind of been done before. And there's so many people that are on that like online store doing this, doing that. Um, you know, it, it's just kind of hard to compete in that world anymore. But I've always said that, like within every 
business or every genre of work, like a, like if you're a barber, there's 400 careers in a barber shop. It might be the comb, the scissors, the the fucking mats that you stand on, the chairs you sit on. Yeah, all these things are are businesses that can be within this one field, right? Yep. And so with motorcycling, what do people like to do? How do you facilitate it? You know, and if you get enough falling, like you said, you can bring people to certain places. You know, and I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of stretching by saying somewhere out in New Mexico, but somewhere like it could be in Dallas, but Dallas is getting very very expensive to have. So mm-hmm. you get a bar, and then you pay the Texas is really like good at collecting you know alcohol tax. So it's really I think it'd be really hard to open a bar in Texas. You know, that's why most of these places that you go to for these events are cash only. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> There's a reason everything's cashed at Daytona Bike Week. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, they also in Texas they have bottle things, so you have to scratch off the labels, and then they come and count the bottles that you uh, you sell. What? Yeah, it's it's Texas is really hardcore on alcohol. Not saying that like, they want you to drink it, but they want their cut. Jeez. So after you finish a bottle, you have to scrape off like one of the labels or something, mm-hmm. and then put it in a bin, and then those bottles get checked by the TABC. And so if you what? you know. If your money doesn't match your bottles. That's wild. Yeah. Sounds like it's draft beer time. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So, I don't know. I, I've always thought about the idea. I think it'd be fun as hell. It'd be cool if you had, like, the right people to do it with, right? Yeah. Like, you don't want some investor that has just put money into it and has no – preferably, they would be the sober one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, no, it's like – you don't want to do it with somebody that's just a bean counter. You know what I'm saying? You want them to yeah. have like a, a passion for motorcycling and almost have like faith in your vision of it. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And maybe they have money and a business sense, not just I have money because my dad passed away and left me a hundred grand. You know what I'm saying? Well, if you would just paint like, you know, a thousand more bikes, you could just fund it on your own. Dude, if I can, if I can become a YouTube star. There you go. So just have a five year plan. Be good. Five years. Hit, give it, hit me. Five years, you'll have the money to do it yourself, and you don't have to have the investor. And start small. I, I with believe. enough land. Buy the land. Just get the land, and then just put your first small building on it with knowing that you want to take it to a certain bigger level, and that plot is going to be big enough to have it at that bigger level. You gotta, but you got to buy, buy land zoned for things like that. You can't just buy it. Perfect. Zone it for that. Yeah. Make sure wherever you're going to buy it, it's going to do it. You can do it. You can make it happen. I'll tell you exactly what I would like. My fav- my. I don't know if I would want it to be a bar underneath. I've always wanted to live in a place that was like kind of like a storefront, like in kind of a more busier area of the city, Mm -hmm. kind of a storefront on the bottom and like a maybe two story apartment or or like a three story building, two stories of apartment living Uh and then like a rooftop kind of patio where you can kind of go out, sit out, have some fucking beer, wine and see the city and the sunset. Like that's my, that would be a great place. If the bottom floor could be like a, Selling something, but also I could pull a bike in and work on it if I need to. That would be my perfect setup. Sounds like there's, like there's gonna be no parking lot for bike probably setup. not, but yeah, I don't know. There's also like the bar could still have bike nights, you could still do certain things. I don't know if I'd be able to have a stunt show there, but you know, I don't know if I want to live on top of a bar though. I don't think I could do it on top of a bar. Depends what time the bar closes, depends when the bar closes. I don't want to be that. There's nothing worse than like waking or finally getting done doing something at eleven o'clock. Like, you want to go have another beer before we go home? And everything closes at ten thirty. That shit sucks. Grinds my gears, dude. Yeah. <laughs> COVID. That's how that all was. Dude, that shit. Nothing was dude, open. Everything used to be open until two a.m. around here. Now it's all closing at eleven, eleven thirty. Yeah. Yeah, it's stupid. Yeah. But our property taxes went up. Maybe it's because they're not getting enough alcohol sales anymore. Yeah. You know. Well, open later. <laughs> anyway. What do you think you're going to do? Me? Yeah. Well, I'm in the golf cart business, babe. <laughs> <laughs> I got a golf cart shuttle business on the beach town in Florida. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna keep doing other things like that and just kind of keep well, I mean, you trying to make you money. You had the bounce house thing, right? That's a very... Well, I had it. I sold it. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. But, but I, so, so, the, so this is like I'm trying to learn business and, you know, be... A stunt writer at the same time. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to balance it. But what I learned was you don't want to invest in a business that's a job. So the bounce house business was a job. Mm-hmm. Like if I didn't do it, it, it just doesn't work right. Where the golf cart shuttle business, if 
my guy's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get out there and start driving at like 7 tonight. Cool. Well, if I hit him up at 8, he's like, oh, yeah, shit happened. I'm not, like, I'm on my way now. That's fine. No one's going to be like, oh, Steve's beach shuttle wasn't here at 7.30 on the side, on the corner trying to pick people up for rides. It doesn't affect no one except my pocket and his pocket. Yeah. The bounce house is if my worker said, oh, I went out last night, I'm going to be late, and you don't show up for Kathy's kid's you know, daughter's birthday at nine, 9 a.m. in the morning yeah. when the party only goes from 9 to 11, that's a huge issue. Yeah. So it was hard to rely on other people because myself, I knew, okay, if I got a party at, you know, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., yeah. I know I'm not going out the night before because I got to be up early. I really need to be, you know, going at like 7, make sure everything's loaded, clean, get there, make sure I get there early just in case, God forbid, you get a flat tire on the way. You just can't yeah. be late for a kid's birthday party. At the end of the day, most birthday parties are short. So that sucked. It was a job, you know, and I want to invest in things that aren't a job. Oh, that makes sense. So, the, so I'm doing the golf cart thing, doing some more, and then I got to figure out the next thing to do. And then what I really want to do is keep taking, make money to invest in the motorcycle dreams, the yeah. bar, the, the events, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's the goal. I think the bar could happen. I think the bar could happen. Yeah. Don't you, you don't know any rich people? But like you said, you want them to have, you want them to have the vision you have. Mm. You know, you you would need somebody that has so much money that just does it because they love it, not because they expect a return out of it. Uh, I would expect. I I can't. I need. I need them to expect a return because I need them to want it more too. You know, but I yeah. don't want them to be like. You know, if you let's just say you have something you're gonna put two hundred grand into this idea, then there needs to be an understanding of like, hey, I'm not spending the next two years paying you back solely. You'll get a percentage of what you own and then you you're paid back through that. And eventually you cross that threshold and then it's all yeah. profit, right? Yeah. That's how some investments work. Drug dealer investments aren't that way though. No. It's like, here's fifty grand, I need my shit back in two weeks, or I'm breaking your knees. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you get you know what I mean? It doesn't I don't want that. I want someone that's like involved in, I don't know. I, I don't think that, uh, I, I remember back in the days when, and I've talked about it on the podcast before, when they would talk about people that would so badly want to be a part of the motorcycle custom brands and culture of like the early two thousands, they would literally give these brands four or 500 grand so they can go buy an 18 wheeler. And so that when they go to the Sturgis, they get to be behind the, the scenes in this brand's thing. And, they're not really an owner. Their money, yeah, they get a bike out of it or something like that. But you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. There was, that was so predominant. Yeah. And, you know, just all these people with money. I don't know if the housing crash kind of killed that, but I need one of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That it's just like, hey, let's do this. And then I, I, I want anything I do and anything that someone does with me for it to be a, a positive for sure. Absolutely. Investment no, I, I, I don't disagree. Um, I mean, I still have always wanted to do the bar thing because mm -hmm. I think, you know, like I said, I can do the stunts and make that a, a bi-weekly thing and it's going to be a good time. Or, you know, you do a bike night every week and then you do the stunt show yeah. the first one of the month or the last one of the month and I'm doing it myself. So it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. But you just got to have, you got to own everything. You got to own the property. You got to own the bar. You you McDonald's probably, mind, mindset. Yeah. You should probably own, um, you know, one 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 or two beers that you guys brew just so that you get a lot of people doing that. I'll but, write um, that down. But then if you do it legally and then you in your controlled environment, that's when you can bring the sponsors involved if it gets big enough and mm. then it can make some real money. But it sucks, like you said, to create this event for Joe Blow to make the money. Yeah. I mean our bike night's been going on in Dallas for five years now and it's like five don't be wrong. years. Oh, I enjoy I enjoy that, you know, it hasn't been as much work as it could have been. I mean, I could have made it yeah. more work. I could have wanted a return on the time investment, but you know, yeah, that, I do think about that. Like, fuck man. What if that was your bar? When I, when I built the studio though, the intent, the intention was to have bike nights here. Yeah. But the guy that lives across the street, wouldn't have it. First yeah. one we had shut it down. And I was like, fuck man. Like there, there's literally that house and then one house across the street. And so you could do burnouts here and the people would hear it, but it's not going to be like, I don't know, man. It, I had a lot more hopes for this place. Once I, I was going to do the whole back set up like a fire pit. I have a fire pit, but 
I was going to clean it up, put some lights out there, some places to sit and chill, and have a whole little thing going on. That'd have been dope. Yeah, but he fucking killed it. So <laughs> I still want to do stuff like that, man. I don't know. I do too. I just I like bringing people together and seeing people have fun. That was probably the biggest takeaway from the camp out. Like just being somewhere and everybody walking up to you and going, dude, this is fucking rad. You know, and yeah. of course I'm in my head the whole time thinking, like, is everybody having fun or not? You know? Um I don't know. We had fun watching you get drunk on stage. Yeah, dude, that's never happened again. No, it totally should happen. No. I'm gonna be making you drinks pouring them double. I feel like uh, I was drinking doubles. I feel like I need to go on an apology tour. No. The thing is, like, I get drunk, and there's so much of us that just talk shit to each other, but then I have a microphone, and I'm talking shit to someone that doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> Everybody there understood that you were talking shit to sit down Steve nine different times while you're on stage getting drunk. Trust me. 100%. Yeah. But the problem was is you think it's just this. You think it's just us three sitting here, and you're talking shit to me. You don't realize that there's 100 other people, you know, Listen to our shit talk, yeah. and you're and you're on the microphone. It, it's like that sometimes, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's funny. Yeah, I felt embarrassed a little bit. I think I had a. I think that's what sobered me up is that I think that something happened while I was blacked out, and then the embarrassment kicked in, and I sobered up. Saw you doing a burnout. Went to see what was going on over there. I think it was when you went to the back where the ramp was and you started peeing in the back off stage. And I think that's what embarrassed you. You're like, why am I doing this? Like, what the fuck? Oh, I don't even remember doing that. I do not. <laughs> at all. Oh, oh my God. God. I'm actually joking. But <laughs> you thought he's, dude, he starts turning red right now. He's like, did I really start peeing <laughs> off the back of the stage? <laughs> no, he didn't. Oh, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> He's boiling right now. Uh, just, you saw the hesitation in his eyes. I remember there was a point where I was so fucking hungry that people were just handing me food because I didn't eat anything. That that's why I got fucked up. I didn't drink that much. I just didn't eat. Yeah, and because uh, we never we were, we were worried about the shitting. Yeah, yeah, true. Y'all just didn't find a secret shitter trailer. I did, Craig's. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I went just, over there and I was like, hey. Uh, you guys, is this yours or did you rent it? <laughs> you know, we rented this. I'm like, oh, cool. Can I shit in here? Because I'd have felt bad if somebody owned it. Oh, yeah. I was in there for 15 minutes. It was is horrible. It? Yeah, I don't know. I was, um, I didn't eat. And I went there with the intention of bumming off everybody else's food that they were making. So. Well, I yeah. will say the food truck that was there was amazing. That fucking shrimp. They brought all that shrimp. Not that. No, the one I love that. I like the brisket. Oh, it was? Pulled I pork nachos and the little chicken poppers or whatever the hell they mm -hmm. had. Yeah, we had a friend. Jake made a brisket. It was pretty good. And then he, he did some uh, jalapeno poppers that were fucking fire. Oh, yeah. I had both of them. For real? Them poppers. Yeah. Were, yeah. I had yeah, like really three of those. Good. Jetty made like a like a chorizo something tacos in the morning. Dude, they were just, they were delicious, man. Saturday night he made some food too. Who? Saturday night, yeah. I don't know. It was fun, man. I enjoyed it. But I'm glad, I don't know, every once in a while I think, like, oh, would it be cool if, like, you just, like, stopped it one year? Like, you just didn't do it? Just to. I did. We stopped ROC. Mm -hmm. And all the time we get people being, you know, when is it? Do it. You know, nonstop. But. It, it, there's this thing, like, I, I don't feel like things should last forever. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't feel like. I mean, there's no, nobody owns Sturgis. It's just this town that now has come together to kind of keep this thing going mm -hmm. that people that are long dead started a long time ago, right? Well, well I mean, there's got to be a committee that picks the date or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's that ownership, but it's not like... <sighs> it's you know not I mean? like... No, okay, it's not like... Like your event. Like, no, like you owned the event. It was the Street yeah. Fighter thing. Yeah, so yeah. now that that's gone, like there's not like the city of St. Louis isn't picking it up going, we want yeah, this Yeah, we're going to do ROC this year. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. But you think yours should stop? At some point, I think it should. I don't know. I feel like it it, right. it. it should stop or if it's not evolving, it should stop. Let's put it that way. But you said you don't want it to evolve getting big. I want it to evolve, but not on those parameters. I want it to evolve in, like, the way things are experienced. Does that Explain make sense? That. No. So... Like, say, for instance, the, the evolution, like, you kind of showed us the power of doing stuff on stage when you came in for and mm -hmm. on Camp Out 4. 
So that was an evolution that we didn't take advantage of something that was there, mm-hmm. right? Um, then bringing in the bike show last year was a great time. Now, I will say that this year's bike show, you couldn't tell if people were salty because they didn't win something, so they were storming off of that just, you know, whatever. But or it took too long. I don't like that vibe. The bike show was only – we were done with the bike show by 7, 3 to 7. It was the other giveaways that were a separate thing, right? And you know what I'm saying about the, the giveaway? Um we had a, lot, a hard time coming up with games. Yeah. And I don't think all the giveaways should be games. And I was thinking if, if you're going to do special bracelets or whatever, they should be numbered. Mm. And you give away prizes to certain numbers. You just call a number out. You pick a number out of a, a thing. It's not a bad And idea. give away stuff. Um, hey, man, this thing just went to uh, the background screen. <clears throat> I didn't touch anything. It just jumped in there. God damn it, Bruce. No, I like that idea. It's um, well, so you it, should, that's what I'm saying. I, that, I want, I want it to evolve. So if the if the pad comes in, the stunt pad, then that's going to be a natural evolution of things, right? Another one. Um, take some of those those gifts, those bags, and why everyone's on stage secretly just go throw in people's tents. They come back to their tent. They're like, "What the hell?" Yeah, that's not a bad idea. And the and the number thing. They, and everything doesn't have to be a game who can drink the most and stuff like that. It needs to be, you know, because that's what took so long. We kept trying to figure out more games to do. Let's just have a few games and then the rest should be just random. You don't Practice. have to. I, I agree to that. So I think that we did too much stuff on stage this 100%. year. And so it needs to be like maybe pushed the stage stuff to a little later. Like maybe, maybe like the club style games should probably start at like 730 or 8. And then by the, by nine ten o'clock they're done, and then people are already on the in the center partying, right? Yeah, the partying should start where people are free to, you know, whatever yeah. they want to do. But there's always like Friday, like it, Thursday and Friday always feels like the more rager nights because people are not Don't thinking about leave. the thousand mile ride they're going to go do on the Sunday. Day, yeah, back home. Yeah, so there's just like those things that you got to think about. Like I, I I want things to grow naturally and evolve into something nice without just picking the low-hanging fruit that every other event throws. Like, mm-hmm. oh, we have space to put 100 vendors right here. Let's do that. It'll add value to the camp out, but I don't know if it's going to add the kind of value that I want to be there. You know what I mean? Yeah. If if we started doing invited builders, that would be a different type of event. I get what you're saying. And I don't want to bring that because that's not what that's really about. You want to involve it to new fun things, not 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 people. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that – I think the camp out this year was definitely less than 1,000. And I kind of I, – I don't think that the number is as important as as far as success is concerned, right? No, no exa- I know exactly what you're saying. Like you said, we did the stage thing. You did the, the bike show. Next year maybe could be – you know, you got a stunt parking lot. The year after that could be, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's adding new – Mm-hmm. things to the event each year that are different so people are like oh well yeah i went to the camp out you know they, they give away things on stage and we all get drunk i'm like oh well, did you get to the did you get to see the stunt show no they didn't have it when i did that oh did you do the bike show no they didn't have it when i did it and then they're like oh no i went last year i went last year i went last year i don't you know and they're like oh yeah but did you hear they're they're doing this this year yeah exactly that's they're like oh okay cool no that's the thing that's that's kind of the aspect that i i I would like things to continue to grow naturally. Um, And I feel like when they don't, when I feel like there's nothing else to bring the table and, you know, it could be, I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like it'd be cool to just do something for 10 years and just see like that was a thing that existed for 10 years. I hope you got to enjoy that. And then now you go try to create something else differently. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so there's part of me that likes that idea. Um, You know, like next year should be, um, you're giving away a, a lowrider ST painted by you. That's on the thing, and someone gets to take it. Yeah, I, if I could, <laughs> no, I mean, if I could figure out how to do like a bike raffle or something like that, I would totally bring that into it. Yeah. I think that'd be cool. So, like, there's plenty of events that'll have a built bike and they'll sell raffle tickets. Um, but the only thing that sucks about that is everyone rides, so no one can be able to take it home. Yeah, figure out how to get a bike home. <laughs> you bring it on a trailer, and then if they the stinger to get if, they have, if they have the chance to be able to ride it home, they can ride it home. If they can't ride it home, then you take it back here and yeah. That way people see it. 
Yeah. And then you take it back here and then they arrange to pick it up. Yeah. So that's the concept. I would like to do something like that. But, but then what you do is you now you do this for the next however many years. But in the background, you're building your bar and you're building this. And so then you say, all right, well, thanks for everybody came. This is done. Next year I'm doing this and it's going to be in a bar that now I – Oh, and you know what I'm saying? Like, you, yeah. you know, it's going to be a bike show. It's not going to be a camp out. It's going to, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. I'm and good now, with leaving the camp out there for as long as, as Adam and them are going to continue to make the campground better. And, and, you know, I think that's a good area to do it. Um, it's perfect. I do, I, like I was telling you, I want to create an event that's based on like an indoor, like get a ticket to get in. Like, Mama tried. I want something like that. Yeah. It's a little more artsy, mm -hmm. you know? I'd really love to have something like that. It's more urban, artsy, uh, invited builders, um, more of that going on. Yeah, they so, have one in St. Louis. Yeah, the the one or the uh, uh, showcase cycle showcase. Thing. Yeah, and it's so a, that's there's the only so many spots that people can you know bring their bikes. And mm -hmm. um, I was planning on going this year, just didn't line up again. But yeah, I wasn't a lot of there. <laughs> but I went the year before, and it was cool. Yeah. But that's what I want to do, man. I, I I think that uh, you know, maybe the camp out can always exist. Maybe not necessarily with uh, my name on it, you mm -hmm. know. But what I love about the camp out is it's, and I try to tell people it's like, yeah, it says fast life, but really, everybody that comes there and all their journeys to get there is like they're creating their own version of the camp out in a sense. And some of those people, it's their first time ever getting out on a bike and going a little bit of a distance. And it kind of open up, opens up the door for them to get the experience of riding and then meet people from other countries and be able to connect the dots. Like, now I have friends in this place, so I can ride my bike here, and I know somebody, so I can – this could be a layover over to the next guy I met at the camp out that lives in this town, and we can – you know what I mean? And that's what the motorcycle community is all about. Exactly. And I've seen that through the stunt side of it is – Exactly, yeah. Almost any city I go to, I can find somebody that will put me up if I, if I mm. need it or, you know, I'm like, hey, I'm coming through this city. Like, who wants to grab dinner tonight? I would be. I need to. I need a break from driving or riding yeah, or whatever. Yeah. You know, you always got somebody, no matter where you go. Uh, and that's really cool about the bike industry. Yeah, that's and that's the concept. You know, having stuff like that will, it'll give people open up more doors for them to have more experiences within motorcycling, and hopefully, motorcycling would last longer in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, because. After you've ridden to every bar in your town and you can't find a guy that will go out and do a, 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 a layover night somewhere, you know, that Traeger looks way more interesting. You know, your wife's not bitching at you when you're in the backyard and making some meat. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yep. I like it. All right. You ready to go to some lunch and shit? Yep. Good Thank deal. you. This is the first time we've ever done anything sober together. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. It wasn't even that much shit talking either. Maybe. Yeah. Are we growing up? No. <sighs> No. All right, cool. All right. Thank you, Steve. No, nah, no problem. Should, time. should we tell them your Instagram? Because I nah. really want to help you out. Doesn't make it. I mean, <laughs> you already put me on the map. <laughs> no, it's all good. All right. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate no it, dude. My back's killing me.